I'm just delighted to be back here in India, as I've told many of you, and probably more than once. My first day ever in the tropics was in India, in Mumbai. I'd flown overnight from Europe. I met with the uh, legendary um, ornithologist, Sally Mali. He took me that afternoon into, um, into the, to the, uh, to the national park that's just uh, close to, to Mumbai. I saw my first fruit bats. I saw little dogs that insisted on walking very close to us because he explained that if they didn't, they would be eaten by leopards. It was one of those days that you simply never, ever forget. So I'm always thrilled to come back here. You have a spectacular country. Um, and I'm hoping I can say something that might um, relate to the management of biodiversity. I want to pose a striking question. The question is, can conservation science make a difference? And we're probably all here because we think that's an obvious question to which the answer is yes. But let's look at what two large conservation organizations say. Two years ago, World Wildlife Fund essentially fired all of its scientists, including my friend Eric Dinnerstein, who worked extensively here in India on tigers and other species. And they claimed that what they were spending on science, which amounted to about 2% or 1% of their budget, was too much. And then you have the comment from Peter Kariva. I hope you can read that because it involves words that have longer syllables than I'm used to understanding. But I think he means that national parks are not a good idea. You may know that Peter Kariva has now left the Nature Conservancy, and some people think it might have been something that I said, especially rather publicly in the pages of the New Yorker. So I want to talk about what science does and what it can do. The story so far is encapsulated by Al Gore's comment that extinction is now a thousand times higher than the normal background rate. And you might wonder, from where did he get that? And the answer is, from me, um, in this paper that my colleagues and I published 20 years ago, where we calculated what we thought the background rate was and what the current rate was and compared the two. We prefer this as a statement because estimating the number of species going extinct per day is fraught with difficulties. We don't know how many species there are. We barely have a good count of birds, uh, mammals maybe, amphibians um, perhaps, but it's still incomplete, and everything else is just a complete guess. But looking at a relative rate, what fraction of a given taxa is going extinct, it is something we can do quite generally and with a lot of different taxa in a lot of different places. So last year, two years ago, my colleagues and I um, updated this in this review article in, in Science. And the main points are species extinctions, very high, irreversible, geographically concentrated, and tropical deforestation is the main driver of them. I should say, by way of um, documentation, that all of the papers that I publish are available on ResearchGate. They are now on academia.edu, um, where they have seemed to have appeared without my help, but I'm happy to see them there. Um, and all the maps, all the graphics um, that I will show are available online with the accompanying GIS files. And in particular, I will rely on a site, www.biodiversitymapping.org, uh, which has an exhaustive collection of biodiversity maps produced by my longtime collaborator, Clinton Jenkins. So to understand how extinctions unfold, we need we need the laws of biodiversity. And I published a paper to that effect with Clinton um, in a wonderful book um, edited by the late Nabjot Sadi, a very dear friend of mine. Um, and by law, I mean it in the sense that it was popular in 
uh, in Victorian England, a, a generality. When we talk about the law of gravity, if I were to let this drop, don't worry, I won't, it might break, but you know, it will fall to the ground. It happens every time. And so I'm looking for the general patterns. And the most famous one of all comes from Alfred Russell Wallace, who in a paper that was short enough and crisp enough to be published in the, papers of, in the pages of Nature, um, basically nailed what the two features of evolution are, the two things that we have to explain, that species occur together in space and in time. And with that um, very eloquent and crisp definition, he then had to think about the mechanism. And of course, famously on the island of Ternate, he did, and wrote to Charles Darwin, who had been sitting at home on his arse and not doing much for about 30 years, uh, and the rest is a history you probably know. But there are other laws of biodiversity. This one involves the distribution of the sizes of species geographical ranges. The, the red line is the data. The black line is a simple two-parameter fit. It's a fit to a log normal distribution. On the x-axis, I have the, um, the log 10 of the geographical range size. So 1, 10, 100,000 up to 10,000 square kilometers. And the y-axis is the fraction of species that have range sizes less than that. So we see, for example, that something like 0.25, 25% of all birds have range sizes between 10 to the 4 and 10 to the 5 square kilometers, which is, the answer is in fact about 30,000 square kilometers. If you do this for flowering plants and marine cone shells and amphibians and terrestrial birds and terrestrial mammals, you'll see the numbers there reflect the... Um, the fractions of species that have the median range size. Half of all flowering plants have range sizes less than 700,000 square kilometers. So what this says is that there is a striking number of species that have small geographical ranges. And the number is increasing. The number is increasing because if you look at the dates at which species were described, um, Linnaeus described things that had big geographical ranges. They were easy to find. Um, if you look at the species of amphibians described in South America, um, fully half of the species that have ranges smaller than 20,000 square kilometers were described in the last few decades. And I'm certain this is true in India. I know from from the work that's done in Atri, they are forever going into the Western Ghats and finding some new species. Um, and, and we heard only yesterday of a new species of macaque um, discovered um, in Arunachal Pradesh, or at least spotted in Arunachal Pradesh, and described the temerity of it by the Chinese on the other side of the border. The next law of biodiversity does not have a polite way of expressing it. It's what I call the mother nature is a bitch law. So pardon my language. You might expect that species that have small geographical ranges might be common within those ranges. That this is where they live. If you live on a mountain top in, in Kashmir and it's your mountain top, surely you ought to be common there. But the reality is overall, species with small ranges tend to be rare within those small ranges. The bird on the left has a tiny range in South America. Um, I nearly died trying to find it. That's the first time the species had ever been photographed. And you said you died trying to take a picture of a little green bird. Well, yes, <laughs> bird watchers will understand. Um, and it's rare within its tiny range. The bird on the right is a little sparrow that's the most abundant household uh, urban sparrow from Mexico City down to Tierra del Fuego. Species with big ranges tend to be common. Um, species with little ranges tend not to be. You know, what do I see outside my hotel window? Black kites, jungle crows, 
species that have huge ranges in, in, in Asia. The number of species of birds and mammals and amphibians we can now map out with some considerable detail. These are birds and they show that the greatest numbers of species are in the tropical moist forests of the world, a pattern that covers all the continents. The interesting and unusual aspect, however, is when we begin to look at species in terms of their geographical range sizes, look at the species that have smaller than the median range. Those distributions are profoundly different. They are concentrated in special places, what my colleague Norma Myers calls hotspots. And the Northern Andes is a hotspot with extraordinary numbers of small range species. Now, small range species are the ones that are at the greatest risk of extinction. So conservation is very much a matter of looking where those species are concentrated. So um, I was unable to, to add the little piece of video this morning that I wanted to do and to stop that video where I could zoom in on northern India. Um, or India in general, and show you that India, both the Western Ghats and particularly the Himalayas, are areas where there are exceptional number of species with small geographical ranges. So India is blessed with large numbers of species with small ranges. If you look at Europe, there are almost none. If you look at North America, there are very few. So the great sort of traditions of ecological thought and exploration have worked in places that don't have many species and certainly don't have many species with small ranges. Now, these data from, again for birds, um, show the likelihood that a species will be considered to be at risk of extinction as a function of range size. Many people, including Sir David Attenborough, have said, you know, it's only species on islands that are going extinct. Well, that's just tosh. Um, species with small ranges on continents are in fact even more at risk of extinction than species are on islands of the same size. Islands tend to be small, but where you have concentrations of small range species, Western Ghats, Northeast India, you have even higher concentrations of species at risk of extinction. And this is for birds, but my colleague John Gittleman has done this for mammals, and other people have done it for amphibians. And, and again, it's a law, it's a general pattern. What this means is that there's really two classes of, of threatened species. There's the ones that most people know about. There's a famous childhood story called, in America called The Wizard of Oz. And, and the heroine of The Wizard of Oz, Dorothy, says, Oh, lions and tigers and bears, oh my. Will there be wild things out there? The answer, of course, is the answer may be no if we don't look after them. So there are species that have large geographical ranges like this Tibetan gazelle that are threatened. But the great majority of species that are threatened are species that have small geographical ranges and they tend to be rare within them. And extinctions happen where extensive deforestation collides with these areas where there are large numbers of species with tiny geographical ranges. So if you look at the patterns of, of deforestation in Asia and you look at where the small ranges are, yes, the Philippines have a lot of threatened species, but you know what, northeastern India does too, and so does the Western Ghats. And this is an image in detail. This is a map of where the threatened species are um, on the borders of Nepal, Bhutan, Arunachal Pradesh, um, Assam, coming down into Myanmar, uh, coming across to China. It's a small area, I'm sorry, the scale got lost on that. Uh, but that is only about 600 kilometers east to west. 
and yet has a very high concentration of small range species vulnerable to uh, the unfolding story of deforestation there. So how do we save species? Well, you're probably all familiar with the biodiversity hotspots idea, but we do need to come down to look at these issues in, in more detail, in a geographically finer scale. And my colleagues and I have done that now twice um, for Asia. We've done it for China by looking at how the Chinese authorities' emphasis on protecting the giant panda has led to the protection of other species. Um, the bottom line of that is it's done quite well, but there are gaps in the coverage of national parks. And my group is working with a group that directly advises the Chinese authorities on where they should be setting up national parks next. And then we have a paper that's in review, which looks at um, the, the Southeast Asia, the, the, the transect from, from Arunachal Pradesh to, um, to Yunnan and then south to Singapore. If you look, and again I'm showing birds, we have maps for birds and mammals and amphibians. Why not anything else? Because those communities have not published their maps yet. If you look at the distribution of those species as their ranges are recorded, it looks like that. And you think, wow, what a pretty map. The problem is that this is a very mountainous area. And species, as we all know, have well-defined elevational ranges. So the first thing we can do is we can trim species ranges by their known elevations by combining these maps with elevational ranges. And you might say, why did IUCN not do that? Because, God love them, IUCN has yet to embrace GIS, which is a rather frightening prospect. So if you trim the ranges by the elevational ranges of the species, you come out with a rather more finely resolved map. There's something else you can do too. You need to look at, at least for forest species, where forest cover remains. Not an easy thing to do for this region because of rubber and teak and palm oil, uh, but we believe we have a, a properly accounted for, for those forest crops. And when you do that, the map looks like that. There's a lot of this region that simply doesn't have any forest cover. But again, you see that this most interesting region that I was being enthusiastic last night about, um, that's on, in northeast India on the borders with, with China and Myanmar, has a very high concentration of threat, very threatened species. Um, they have small ranges, they're vulnerable to deforestation. This is the place where um, we need to be concerned. Um, one of the two places we need to be concerned where species might go extinct if, if there is an increase in, in rubber, in teak, in palm oil, and, and all the rest of it. Now, we all know about the Western Ghats, uh, and my apologies for Robin for not using the Western Ghats as, a, as an example, but I'm limited by time. Um, we can do the same sort of thing in different regions and come up with now a much more focused effort on where the priorities are. But even so, we're a long way from taking actions. I want to show you one of the consequences of this work before I go on to that. This is a species of bird that IUCN, BirdLife International in this case, thinks it's not, is not threatened. It says it has a range of 41,000 square kilometers, but in fact, only 8,000 square kilometers of that range um, is within the elevational preferences of the bird. And only 7,000 square kilometers of that range is in forest. The rest of it has been deforested. And only something like 2% of this species range is protected by national parks. So we think that this is a species that IUCN ought to much more carefully examine in terms of whether it's threatened or not. And in a paper that we have review in, uh, under review in Nature, um, and I ask you not to take a photograph of this, 
Um, we have summarized all the birds in uh, a, a half a dozen, uh, ten uh, key tropical areas worldwide. Um, if you look at the IUCN classification, you see that there are three species of bird that have ranges less than 100 square kilometers, and IUCN considers them to be, to be critically endangered. But in fact, there are a total of six species that have ranges that small when you take into consideration the, the known elevational ranges and the, and the forest loss. Even more dramatic it is for, for species of less than 5,000 square kilometers, because there you have a substantial number of species that IUCN thinks are of no concern whatsoever, the least concern, and yet they have small geographical ranges um, fragmented ranges, um, ranges that are poorly protected by national parks. So the bottom line of this is to suggest that particularly for regions like Southeast Asia, um, Southern Asia, that IUCN has quite seriously underestimated the fraction of species that are at risk of extinction. And you need to know what species are at risk of extinction if you're going to go to the next step which is to make this biogeographical knowledge something you can use to take actions to save species. So, red list probably underestimates, perhaps by as much as a third of the species that are at risk of extinction. This is particularly a problem for, for Asia. I mean, not surprisingly, countries like Myanmar are very, very poorly known. Um, and we need, to, you know, we need to revise these red lists with with geographical information data and remote sensing. Finally, I want to talk about how we move to an operational scale. And alas, I can't do that for Asia because I haven't done that yet. So I want to show an example from where we have been working for a long time. I want to talk about the coastal forests of Brazil. It's one of the areas that has very high concentrations of threatened species. If you do the remote sensing of this area, this is three Landsat images stitched together, so that's about 500 kilometers east to west. You can see that the, the area has remarkably little forest remaining. If you zoom in, you can see that that forest um, has a very large number of small fragments. That's what happens if you take away the fragments that are smaller than 100 hectares. You see that there is a striking amount, in fact almost 20% of that forest is in small fragments. Well, what do we know about the survival probabilities, the extinction risks, of species in small fragments. That's what the area looks like, and you get the sense there's forest and it remains, but it's in small, isolated patches. If we map out the, where we think species could be, we discount the small patches, we see that the greatest concentration of threatened birds is in a series of forest islands that are in the northeastern uh, portion of that, of that, of, of that image. Um, the big bay there is Guanabara Bay, that's Rio de Janeiro. So you see that there is a very compact set of areas where we think the greatest number of threatened species are. What do we know about fragments? The biggest ecological experiment ever done is a nearly 40-year study established by Tom Lovejoy in the Amazon knowing that this area was going to be deforested, he set aside experimental plots of 1, 10, 100, and 10,000 hectares and followed the fate of birds and butterflies and mammals and a variety of other things over time to see how quickly species would disappear. That's a, a close view and you can sort of see you know, lots of little tiny fragments of, of forest that were set aside before the area was deforested. So we know how many species they had to start off with, and therefore we could work out how long it took them to lose those species. The general idea is that there would be some sort of a decay in the number of species over time, 
And from that, you could calculate a, a relaxation rate, a half-life, if you like. What's the time to lose half the species? Those are the data, that you can analyze those data in a whole variety of different ways, but the general pattern is clear. The small fragments, one hectare fragments, lose a lot of species and they lose them very quickly indeed. Um, even the 100 hectare fragments lose species over a period of a few decades. Working with my former graduate student, Tom Brooks, um, we also combined this with studies done in East Africa in Kakamega. To get this sort of, again, it has a law-like quality. I'm not going to claim this is a law because we don't have many studies. But you get the idea that there's a clear relationship between the log of the relaxation time and the log of the um, fragment size. And it's such that even if you have fragments of 100 square kilometers, you're going to lose your species over a matter of uh, several decades. You need to have big fragments if you're going to maintain the full diversity of the species present. The greatest species diversity is found in the tropical moist forests of the world, and bird species are an example of this, with high concentrations of birds in the Amazon, tropical Africa, Southeast Asia. The greatest number of threatened species, however, is where geographical small ranges collide with excessive deforestation. A good example of this is the coastal forests of Brazil. We can map out in some considerable detail where those species are likely to live. This particular image uh, plots the remaining forest against elevation and color codes the image by how many threatened species remain in these places. All of these images are courtesy of my colleague Clinton Jenkins. If we want to understand why there are so many threatened species here, one can look at the remote sensing. This is a landscape that is extraordinarily fragmented. These patches of forest tiny and isolated, contain the largest number of threatened species in the Americas. The obvious question is what we can do about this. When faced with these images, I felt that everything we know about the loss of biodiversity from fragments suggests that the most effective conservation action would be to reconnect those fragments. As we close in on this image, the quality of the grazing land here is all too obvious. You can see the brown lateritic soils shining through. This is extremely bad land. Bad land, of course, means that it's cheap to purchase. It can grow carbon cheaper than it can grow cattle. The need to reconnect these patches is not just limited to birds. The area on the right is Hebeo Yunyao, a nature reserve, and it's the home to the golden lion Tamarin, a charismatic little monkey um, that has been rescued from the very brink of extinction. The tamarins want to go forth and multiply, and to do that they have to cross this gap. And what you're seeing now is how this gap has changed in the years since my group, Saving Species, purchased the land. You can see that that gap is becoming greener. In this image, it's quite clearly a lot greener than it was historically. And that's because we have removed the cattle from this area. We've planted trees, we've restored the land, and the forest is beginning to come back. So who is the we? My organization, SavingSpecies.org, raised the money. We gave that money to a Brazilian NGO, the Golden Lion Tamarin Association, who bought the land and then handed that land over to the Instituto Chica Mendez, essentially the Brazilian Park Service. 
The Cameron Association is also doing these plantings, so you can see the forest coming back at really quite a, a remarkable rate. We use child labor to plant the trees. Here are the local school children from, uh, from the nearby school. And the next clip, which I'm not going to show in its entirety, is taken at exactly this spot. We have not just merely destroyed so much of the world's tropical forests. What we have left behind is in tatters, in fragments. And those fragments are often too small for species to maintain viable populations. There just aren't enough males to go around for the females and females to go around for the males. And of all the places, of all the fragments, one that I thought was particularly tragic was the one immediately behind me. This is the Union Biological Reserve in coastal Brazil, about 100 miles east of the city of Rio de Janeiro. Because in this isolated patch of forest are a whole load of species on the brink of extinction, the most charismatic of which is a beautiful little monkey called the golden lion tamarind. And the golden lion tamarinds in that fragment could not go forth and multiply into the forest over there because there was the cattle pasture behind me. And when I saw that cattle pasture for the first time about eight years ago, a cattle pasture just like the one I'm standing in, I thought it has to go. And so we have made it go away. This is a restored forest. I helped raise money for my friends at the Asociação Mica Leão Dourado, the Golden Lion Tamarind Association, have planted this forest and it now connects that once isolated fragment of forest in the Union Biological Reserve to a much larger area of forest over in this direction. It's what we call a biological corridor and it means that the golden line tamarinds that were once imprisoned in this forest island, this forest fragment behind me, can now cross through these small but growing trees and go and find new habitats, new homes, new places for their, for their tamarind families. There's something else that's important about this fragment too. When you have small fragments, the ecological balance gets out of whack. And one of the things that happens in, in small fragments is that you lose, you lose the top predators. You lose the pumas, you lose the jaguars, because they too cannot cross in this case, from the big forest over there to the fragment behind me. One of the most exciting discoveries this year was, well, how do I put it politely, puma poop. And the puma poop in the forest behind me means that the pumas are coming back into the forest that was once isolated. The pumas rule. They are the top predators and they keep down the smaller predators, which, if left uncontrolled, can have a devastating effect on small birds, on golden land tamarinds, and other things as well. What you're seeing here is ecological healing. We've gone from a cattle pasture that was a barrier to the forest species to a landscape that is healing, is restoring, we are re-establishing its connectivity. And with that, the tamarinds, the pumas, and all their friends will come back, and indeed, they are coming back. I'm going to show you a couple of images, one taken before we brought the land, and one taken about, um, about three years ago now. 
So you can see that valley is filling in very, very satisfactorily with, with trees. Um, this is what it looked like before we bought the land. That's what it looks like now. Um, there is a, a substantial amount of forest connectivity. Um, a few years ago, uh, a very excited Brazilian got on the phone and told me that the Golden Lion Tamarins were now dispersing through this forest cover. Um, he also told me that they found puma poop. Um, and that's significant because it means the pumas, the, the big cats, are moving into the fragment. And when they come in, they take down the numbers of medium-sized predators, like a, a, a weasel-like animal called a tyra, that's a major, major predator. So, you know, in a very short period of time, we've reconnected this landscape. We've created 8,000 hectares of continuous habitat, and we've done it for a very, very modest investment of money. So, who is saving species? These are people you might recognize. That's Trevor Price. And Patricia Wright, the lemur biologist. Uh, Peter Raven, the Zurich Botanic Garden. Me, Tom Lovejoy, and Ed Wilson. And we believe that conservation science is a very effective tool. If we're going to do conservation, we need to be smart. We need to think about what we're doing and where we're doing it. That conservation will not be best achieved by raising trillions of dollars if it's misspent. Now, I am fully aware that not every problem in the world comes from connecting forest fragments. But in the biodiverse, rich parts of the world, many of the threats come not just from habitat loss, but from habitat fragmentation. And we have created a model whereby we raise funds, we give it to local groups, we never buy land ourselves, we empower local conservation groups. Conservation is like politics. It's local. If you do not solve the local problems, you cannot make conservation work. And we believe that the effort that we put into doing good science absolutely pays off. Thank you so much.